came and got you out of your studio. Uh, but we've moved the lecture time to 6 p.m. so that you can get here on time. Because when it's at 5 p.m., you're always late. Now it's at 6 p.m. give a very brief introduction to the lecture series, uh, which is at 6 p.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, we had a lecture last week that was canceled because of weather. That's a tall meeting. And he will lecture on March 1st um, as a make up. Uh, Professor Wong is going to introduce the lecture for tonight, but I'll tell you a little bit more about the, the rest of the lecture series. On uh, March 8th, um, We'll have a, a DC lecturer, Susan Dieter, uh, Susan Dieter, who's going to visit and put the studio down uh, on the first level. You may know this year we are uh, we have three lectures that are associated with the uh, NVRC, the National Veterans Resource Center Competition Building, uh, which will be over uh, on the corner of um, Kraus and University, well, Kraus and Waverly. Uh, we're running, a, the university's running a competition, and the three finalists will all come and lecture uh, here at the school. The first one will be on the 22nd of March, um, and I think the first one is Snowetta. I don't know if you guys know Snowetta. It's an, uh, it's an uh, Oslo-based office. They have a New York-based office as well. Um, they've designed a lot of very famous buildings, including the Alexandria Library and a very famous uh, performing arts center in, in Oslo. Um, on the 31st of March, Shop will lecture. Um, they're also finalists for the NVRC, the National Veterans Resource Center. Um, on the 5th of April, Byron Merritt, who is a vice president uh, for global branding for Nike Corporation, uh, is, will be lecturing for us. Uh, Byron is, a, is trained as an architect, but he does uh, uh, Nike global branding. It's pretty, I think it should be the exciting lecture. Then on the 7th of April, David Ajay uh, from Ajay Associates, another of the finalists for the, um, for the NBRC building. What was that? Uh, David Ajay is the 7th of April, is another finalist for the NBRC building, and he will lecture. And then on the 14th of April, Robert uh, Yes. Robin Vincent from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, will lecture. So you will see all of these same lectures listed on the posters on either end of the wall. And if you didn't know it already, you now know that the lectures are at 6 p.m. I hope I will see you all back for the next lecture. Um, so Tong Ming will lecture on the 1st next week. of March. That is next week uh, at 6 p.m. here. And yeah, so very happy to have Professor Bing Bu here tonight. You may know uh, he's teaching our Three Cities Asia uh, studio this summer. Uh, and he, we just had a meeting about that. He also, so uh, uh, Professor Wang is going to give the introduction. Um, and without further ado, I'll introduce Professor Fei Wang, teaching here, uh, has a practice in Shanghai and out of. Syracuse, and he's going to give uh, an introduction to Professor Bing Bu. Can you guys hear me? Do I need this? No? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Bing Bu was my studio professor 15 years ago, <laughs> and with Ching Yu Ma at the same time, and in Shanghai. And he has been a long term collaborator of me and my long-term friend, and he's an, you can see here, he's an architect, urbanist, writer, journal editor, artist, curator, and entrepreneur. And Bing Bu is the principal of one design in Shanghai, China. He practices architecture worldwide. His built projects are in China, Washington DC, and Toronto. His work has been selected and shown in Shanghai Biennale in 2002, Shenzhen Hong Kong Biennale in 2007, and Utopia 2 in Brussels in 2008, Chengdu Biennale in 2011, Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., and Guangzhou Triennale. And Bingbo is also a curator of many exhibitions worldwide, including Two Mu at Home in Shanghai in 2012, Ningbo, The Metamorphosis of a Chinese City at Aedas Berlin in 2003, and Unnatural, 
and in Beijing, and Spectacle at the Power Station of Art in Shanghai, and Shanghai Art and Design at Westbound Art Center in Shanghai just uh, past, uh, uh, past month. And he also teaches studio at schools such as Tongji University, Shanghai Jiao Tong University, uh, Washington University St. Louis, and University of Southern California, and he'll be teaching uh, with us in the summer. And he also published uh, quite a lot, and including uh, Time Plus Architecture. Also, he was a guest editor for two special issues. And in the last, and he's also an owner of a place. It's called the Gallery Bar and Restaurant. The Chinese name means corner, gala. And, and it's, a, it's a restaurant slash bar slash gallery slash furniture shop slash working space slash event space. And it, since its beginning, it's been the central place for architectural discourse in Shanghai. So it hosts all kinds of debates and events two to three times every week. And Bingbu received VR from Tsinghua and MR from Yale. Without further ado, please welcome Professor Bu. Good evening, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? No. 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 Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming here this evening. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here to uh, make this presentation to you all. Uh, I know this chart might appear a little bit suspicious that a office doing so many different things. Uh, although it's called one, but it's never a practice focus on anything. It's been very much spread uh, doing different things. Uh, we do urban design projects. We do uh, planning strategies. We do architectural projects. We also got commissioned public art. And I'm also a curator doing art exhibition and design exhibitions. So um, I'm, I'm going to introduce you through many of these different practices uh, the office has been through in the past 12 years. And maybe we can have some discussion or you have a, a idea about what this kind of office could be. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce about two exhibitions I curated uh, in year 2013 uh, Spectacle and in year 2016, this year, uh, the uh, Fusion Power. First, I will start with this Spectacle. It's called uh, 12 Presentations of Contemporary Museum Architecture in China at Power Station for Arts, Shanghai. Um, it's an exhibition about architecture, so, but uh, it in the, in the very beginning, it came to our minds that why we do architectural, architectural exhibitions while the real piece is there, you can visit. Why do you collect documents about architecture and put them on a wall in a museum space? What's, what's the point of that? So we decided about these, um, on these I should, okay, I should start with why, why we, we, we decided to do this exhibition. It's invited by Power Station of Arts, a uh, power plant being converted into museum, contemporary art museum space in Shanghai uh, just the year 2012. So they want to host a exhibition about architecture and in particular museum architecture. Uh, they found the architect for this power station conversion works, Zhang Ming and me and Zhang Jiajing, we three together decided to, uh, to host an exhibition about museum architecture. And we found the background information that in the three years before 2013, China actually built 1,000 museums. It's like one museum in a day in the, in the past three years. With this huge quantity, we decided not to do a exhibition like usually curators do, select the best 10 
architecture, museum architecture in China and give an award to them. We decided to invite architects as well as artists and other professions to do their own presentation about contemporary Chinese museum architecture. Uh, so that's the exhibition called Spectacle. We found it's, a, it's really a spectacle about 1,000 museums in three years. So, we have a small screen in the entrance. It's actually a real-time monitor to a outside temporary structure. We call it the Archichoke Influenza, uh, designed by Atelier Z Plus and Archimixing, the two studios, uh, jointly. We found that we need a real museum piece reflecting on these phenomena instead of all documents. So that, that's their response to this project. And it's a temporary structure with a lot of reflecting steel panels with a garden inside. And it's located in an in, 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 in urban environment. People might ignore them or might go inside and take a look at the garden. And also there's a hidden a video screen there attached to the wall with these um, main major venue exhibition seen here. Uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the main exhibition, we have the other 11 pieces for this exhibition. At the entrance is this work called Largeness, Smallness by Zhang Ming, who is the architect for this building itself. Uh, in this one, they have all these recently built uh, government projects printed on translucent glass boxes and made them floating in these water, uh, it's a very shallow water pool uh, elevated one meter above ground. And on the other corner, we can see this paper wall is done by Jeffrey Johnson from Columbia University with their team of uh, China Mega Cities Lab. They did research about uh, museum architecture uh, buildings built in the past three years and going to be built in the next three years. And made a big clutch about all these uh, ground floor plans. And we have uh, the other curator uh, Zhang Jiajing, he did a work called Nine Pieces, which is uh, the venue itself being cut into nine pieces, uh, made into a sculpture-like. And we have also artists. Uh, it's an artist group called the Museum of Unknown, I will introduce later. And that's the, that's the entrance project. And we also have a special project called Unbuilt. It's, um, it's a project calling for architects to submit their museum architectural projects not getting built. Actually, we started this initiative um, two weeks before the opening of the, of the show, but we received about 50 models from the, all the architects in the city. It appears that every architect almost have a museum building never realized and have a not very nice model kept there in their office bookshelf. And it's a great contrast of this wall of all these built ones and all these unbuilt ones in front of them. And also we, uh, I collaborated with a film director with this project. It's called Museum Watch. Um, we captured uh, video clips all around the building, pretend to be surveillance camera images, and put them in a group of TV monitors and put in a, ra in a ring form out outside at the entrance to the main exhibition. So people pass by, and since there are a few monitors, real-time monitors mixed with these video clips, people occasionally find out they're in these images, but also it disappears and mixes with these clips. 
and of always is it's sometimes uh, neglected by the audiences. And it was interesting is that at, at, at the second day, museum security department had a emergency meeting because they thought it's someone leaks these surveillance videos to the outside. And we also have the architect's urbanness from Shenzhen. It's a representation of their work called uh, Contemporary Art Center. It's a building project proposal they made. They did a one to two replica of the real situation uh, and their attitude about uh, blend contemporary art into life or, or life into contemporary art. And this, this one becomes the children's section in the museum. So people hang around here, kids are doing the coloring of these uh, isometric views and put them back on the wall. We also have a photographer's project uh, who is very the, the best uh, professional architectural photographer in Shanghai. He was commissioned to do a um, lot of the, these landmark buildings in Shanghai. He was also uh, he also photographed uh, Rock Bound Museum in Shanghai. Uh, besides these commission works, he also photographed everyday activities around the museum, um, like people uh, wearing pajamas walking around the construction site, uh, and opening models, uh, having noodles at cross street restaurants. He put all these uh, all these uh, pictures into a video projection onto these actual <coughs> project documents, the, the Rockbound Museum facade there uh, becomes a video installation called Elevation. Uh, then there's also this very interesting art, uh, artist project called Art Feliz. They, this group is called Museum of Unknown. It's an artist's group. Their project is an on-site leasing um, activity. They get about 50 pieces arti artists work, put them in this, inside of this structure. And this person sitting there is uh, writing these, making contracts with these visitors. You pay a deposit and can carry that piece of art back to your home. Uh, this, in, in this way, the artist group believes um, they want to deconstruct the traditional meaning about Museum Institute. So uh, art originally should be in be private and in domestic space. Why they appear in public space or they appear in public space in a form could be in a form different from a museum, but rather like a library. Okay, that's the spectacle uh, exhibition. Uh, last month, I also curated this one called Fusion Power as part of Shanghai Art and Design 2016. Um, this exhibition, the chief curator is by a local artist, Ding Yi. Um, and we have four curators, uh, we, each one curating an individual part of this one. Uh, the overall theme of this exhibition called Design in Change or Trans Design, the, right now emergent changes happening to design and art. So my, my part is fusion power and we have curator from Guangzhou doing the New, New Guinea and Ben Hu who's, a, who's from uh, UK, he does the futures by design and Beatrice Linza who's from Italy who did the ideas in actions part. So fusion power is a is a uh, the topic of this tries to explore a issue on, on culture, which is a to me it, I feel it's a very tough one because no nobody in the art or design industry actually talk about culture. Culture becomes something you always avoid to talk. It's a result, or sometimes it's a very macro narrative by governments, government agencies. Individuals try to stay away from the term of culture, but 
culture or identity is always there. It's affecting our everyday life, or it's affecting our, the way we uh, we also we 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 do art projects, we do design. So for for this project, I I picked a similar method to these. Um, spectacle project. I also invited 12 uh, different 12 designers, artists to do this together in this space uh, in the middle of the exhibition. I, I gave them each one a, a corner, a section from this, from this uh, uh, square space and with a centerpiece in the middle. The exhibition started from this one, with this one, it's called Lost. It's a, um, it's a Shanghai-based designer called Wang Yang. She uh, went to Germany for education and came back in 2003 and started her own business. Her work is always about local identity and global identity, Shanghai needs. So for this one, I told her that maybe should not be a collection of her existing works, although these ones corresponding to the topic very much. Uh, she gave me this proposal. It's a cubicle space divided by two walls crossed in the middle and then have eight pieces of mirrors. So on each side you will see a, a window and looking inside there's an installation. So these two pieces of windows will give a panoramic view of whatever is shown there, and each piece inside will be reflected into four around. And more interestingly, I read it this way. It's not just about um, the object itself, but rather uh, it's always overlaying. Your perception about the space is always overlaying with something else. That's her answer to these uh, fusion or identity issue. And we also have a newspaper for this exhibition called Fusion Times, organized by a graphic designer and type designers. It's always an issue to about uh, font matching. Um, in, in, in China, it's actually not so many people working on the font design because Chinese has so many fonts, uh, characters, 6,000 characters. It's a very tough job for font designers. But now with computer technologies, uh, it's getting easier and easier. It's usually you design less than 1,000 and can get the rest 5,000 automatically generated through softwares. So we have three font designers uh, in this exhibition. The, the, these ones is, is uh, called uh, New Gothic, Chinese Gothic font. It's a Chinese font but matching to these um, Western uh, Gothic fonts. And we also have these uh, New Sun Dynasty fonts as the main body text. And also we have these uh, Yin Yonghui, who's a designer, pick up traditional Chinese fonts found in these uh, historical uh, engravings uh, to transform into nowadays computer fonts. Then in the, in the middle of the exhibition comes this installation by Michael Lin, who's an artist based in Taiwan, called After Xianigao. I found this one be the most intriguing centerpiece for this exhibition as Michael uh, was using this um, Xianigao in the 50s as a reference or reflections on nowadays China's modernization, influence from the West and the local, uh, how local locality, uh, how, how a, a regionalism could be formed. Um, in, in, in his work, he used uh, Le Corbusier and the Pierre Janet, uh sofa design for these major buildings in Senegal and distorted them into different scales, enlarged or scaled to smaller or stretched up. Or, or, or. So e each chair there becomes a very different 
uh, scale. So these standardized modernism value here being transformed into a variety of orange hues slightly different e from each other. And also if you look at the works to, uh, close, it's the, the original chairs are, are very strong, uh, with, covered with leather. These ones are just canvas fabric. It, it has this very soft touch. Um, in, 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 this week, in this work, we found that the, the, the local response to, a <coughs> to, to the globality, globalization, could be um, reflected in, in, the, in, 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 in this way. And also, Michael Lynn quote um, Indian philosopher uh, Amai, Amaya, Amatya Sen that a identity, in particular cultural identity, should be formed through openness to the others instead of constantly questioning oneself, who I am. Also, we got an elephant in the room. It's a, a installation work by Ben Wu, who's the architect for Xin Tian Di, which is a very famous urban renewal project finished in year 2000, 2002. Um, in, in this work, uh, Ben Wu tries to reflect on the fast-growing urbanism, in, uh, urban scene in China. Uh, he made these, these movie studio-like setting from all recycled or collected materials from market, from garbage, and made them into a, 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 a instant city-like and shot a movie out of this scene. Uh, to him, that the, f the, the fusion is not an issue, but a, a city, if it's about humans, it's a nightmare or it's a dream. It's all very personal, it's very to one's heart. We also have uh, this bamboo daily work from Chen Haolu, who's a very famous architect based in Hangzhou. He has a, a, a countryside establishment. He designed uh, bamboo structures for a pig farm, very famous one. Uh, he's teaching at the school, uh, Art Academy of China, uh, two students about making uh, kites from, from, from bamboo, but also utilizing very contemporary uh, methods about uh, uh, structural engineering. So to him, it's kind of these local crafts and um, modern technologies meeting together uh, reflects the, the, the theme of fusion. Then we have a, a special project uh, called What's Your Comfort Food? Since we are talking about fusion, a lot of people know the term of fusion from the culinary field. I talked with a group of chefs. It turned out that they hate the term fusion a lot. It say, they say it's, 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 they really hate this word about fusion. It's, there's only design of food or or good food or bad food. So in this, in this installation, they, they, called it, uh, they made this project called What's Your Comfort Food? Each of the chef wrote down about their definition of comfort food and made a video of how they make it. So we also have questionnaires on the site and ask the visitors to write down uh, what's your comfort food as well as where's your hometown as these two uh, might be might connect you somehow. So on the wall there we have uh, 60 jar, uh, glass jars and each day we will fill one jar with a visitors uh, question answers there and uh, after this exhibition uh, we will make a, 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 a document about what's the popular ones or what's what are people thinking about and we also received a lot of interesting drawings and answers to these questions. Uh, there, uh, on the other corner of the exhibition, we also have this uh, project called the 
spiritual space by architect Yu Ting and interior designer Li Xiang. It's a dual space attached together. On one side, uh, this part designed by Yu Ting is a three meter by three meter by three meter uh, space divided into a domestic space, interior space for a five people family, which is quite common 30 years ago in Shanghai, which reflects a uh, everyday life, wisdom, and locality. And also it's a, uh, it becomes a platform for these collected um, industrial design objects from the past. Then on the other side, the interior designer Li Xiang designed this very fancy, empty, free-floating space with full of objects, more like a contemporary uh, Shanghai people's daily life. Uh, it's always pointing to some foreign land imagination or urban fairy tales. It's also about a younger generation's imagination about life uh, uh, connected or contradicted to the existing historical one. Um, this setting of uh, called Daily Life is from a furniture brand design studio called Zing Life. It's called Daily Life Imagination. They did some unusual pieces like this chair made with this uh, bronze backside. It's actually the Chinese people used to scrap one's back. And, but they are organized in such a art deco way to uh, transform the meaning in everyday, in everyday life, art or, or, or lowness to highness to, to blend the original meaning with its new setting. Like this washing board is actually a tea tray with this end to could hold the glass and this part to hold the scones uh, for a British uh, afternoon tea setting. Then there's this uh, atelier meal, their vegetable, vegetable project. It's a, it's a studio, they work a lot about the relations between man-made objects and natural found, found project, uh, objects, like the tree, tree branches, turned into a lighting, and they always play with these uh, table openings. And so one designer found one piece of tree branch, the other one will pick up that question and transform that into a design object and around. Then we also have this um, westbound design corridor, which is just outside these, uh, this exhibition venue there with all these designers, architects' offices around outside there. Uh, we have uh, GOM's office, Death House office, uh, Tong Ming, who's coming next week, his office there, and Atelier Z Plus, and Art Union uh, by Yuan Feng, and also Exception, is, which is a fashion brand uh, based in Guangzhou, but come to Shanghai for their first studio space. Okay, so that's probably all for exhibitions. Um, the, my office also did a lot of uh, urban design projects starting year 2004. And uh, uh, the first project I want to introduce is called the Jiaxing Sumo new, new, new Town. It's a project commissioned by a developer, Sumo Group. They found the opportunity as the high speed train proposed for between Shanghai and Hangzhou, and the only stop there in, in Jiaxing. They tried to get this area next to the train station developed towards the city center. So our proposal was. Uh, since it's a huge area of land, 10 square kilometers, 
uh, we say try to divide it into small pockets instead of one big chunk of uh, large developments. So we found these uh, existing canal and made them green belt, make a slow connection from the train station to the center city. So it's not necessary to always be in high speed as you're already very fast from Shanghai to Hangzhou. And for here, it becomes a slow movement. And this slow movement will divide the land into several pockets. So each one will be one to two square kilometer. And each one will have a distinctive character in them. So we use the uh, urban, uh, urban map uh, for reference, like New York, Rome, or typical American suburb cities, or uh, other village area patterns for this project. Then we also give them a uh, more detailed design for this pocket itself. Um, Two years later, we did a similar project in Shanghai. Uh, although they are very different scale, but I would say it's they are actually in very similar, very similar urban approach. It's called the Pudong Waterfront Wall. It's a flood containing wall along the Huangpu River, um, which is three meters higher than the uh, urban grade, so urban street grade. So. Instead of uh, proposing a, a, a green, a park with hill slopes on it, we suggest that we should expose this wall instead of hiding that. And this wall itself be, should become a um, platform for all kinds of urban activities. And as this form folding in itself, it will generate four different kinds of urban situations. As it's towards the city side, there will be urban garden as it's uh, on the street level. And it can also be urban balcony if it's elevated to this wall top level. And on the other side, it will become harbor and islands to accommodate different activities. Either becomes a transportation hub or becomes a more um, natural reservation or could be submerged in the flooding season. So eventually, this wall structure alongside the river will become a, um, a vessel or a collect collective form for different kinds of urban activities. Like uh, people in the inland could come to the waterfront for all kinds of activities. So it's not a urban design deciding what's nice to be there, what you should do there, but rather provide a strategic framework to collect uh, urban activities and let the people speak what they, they could do there and what, what, what can be the, the, the final form of this waterfront. Um, the next project is uh, the other, on the other side of the river, the Huangpu River in Shanghai, it's also the site our summer students are going to work on, the Yangpu District waterfront. Um, it's an it's a area about 10 square kilometer, uh, 4 square kilometer, uh, pretty big. It used to be city's industrial area. It has lots of factories inside and has these uh, kind of urban slum situation with a lot of self-constructed buildings from uh, 1950s, 60s. And it also has China's first uh, workers dormitories uh, constructed by Japanese uh, manufacturing companies. So it's a, it's a great mixture of all kinds of things. And in the development of city, it's an area a little bit left behind. Um, with not much things happening. So for the next wave of developments as lots of capitals are coming here, you, as you can see from this, from this area photo, on the waterfront, a lot of lands has been raised and cleared. So in, in this strategic plan, we proposed for this 
um, uh, government and developer, we, we, we try to make a different development method. We say that the advantage of this area is actually its affordability, not its uh, competitiveness to other fancy areas in Shanghai. And we suggest that we can keep these high-end developments to the waterfront and leave these areas behind to creative industry or to uh, local, uh, local commercial activities or new residentials. So it becomes a, a grade for, for value. Uh, the, the, the high value stays on the, on the waterfront and it gives back to these inlands. And the service and the production will actually support this new industry on the waterfront. So we, we made these diagrams. These areas could be made of two kinds of modules. Uh, the vertical one connecting waterfront to inland will be about capitals movements. And these ones along these uh, uh, latitude movements will be more about industrial connections. So different urban environments at every different layer towards these waterfronts. So then there will come a lot of different opportunities. There can be vital streets and commercial towards the waterfront. There will be residential towers, uh, fine air points to construct it. And manufacturing activities could also be preserved in industrial sites. And urban complex and high-end offices, hotels, would happen to the waterfront and historical buildings being preserved, urban plazas uh, being inserted in the urban fabric and with a huge waterfront green and, and to the very end. And then there will be uh, layers of activities and for these uh, vertical module and different things would happen in, inside and Eventually, the new development will take place. Uh, public space, green and park, and then have these uh, restored or reused uh, manufacturing sites and streets and the renovation of existing urban fabrics and a small uh, plaza. So. It becomes a module and a model development. A development pi pi <coughs> paradigm could be picked up for this whole area and for a, 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 a prospective future there. Uh, following this project, we also did this proposal uh, called Waterfront, Music Waterfront for, a, um, uh, for, for this competition. It's a, it's a multi-theater project, very high density, with residential office, uh, music studio, and theaters. Same diagrams following previous studies. And we picked up a precedence in Shanghai, a multi-theater project in 1930s, and say it's uh, the reason for this kind of project is people not just seeing these shows' performance, but they also enjoying being watched and watching each other. And we also started models in the United States, uh, Lincoln Center, and uh, Performing Arts Center in Los Angeles. So the project is likely to put all these quantity of developments into a very small parcel of land and make them vertically together. So we decided about the vision of the project to be a high density development blended into the urban context and with a very comprehensive movement uh, vertically and vertically and horizontally. And then we start to structure the program from the street level to the intermediate level to the rooftop or second nature 
and two small mini towers for studios, and then the more private 60 meter platform, and then these residential, high end residential programs on the top. That's a program. Circulation and different kinds of public space uh, in, in, in this area. And a section which allows uh, indoor performance and outdoor activities as well. And this public platform will connect these buildings together. And it has these very complicated traffic systems connecting everything together. So it becomes a landmark on the waterfront, uh, but not just a, a, a monumental building, but a vertical city with multiple identities, different powers. Each one could be distinctive, not sharing any common building languages, architectural features, but clustered together to form a vertical a lifestyle. And the essential part of this project will be these connected platforms, which people could see each other. And it's a mega structure, but it's still a mega structure uh, for future developments, for architectural projects individually happening within this infrastructure. Okay, then something uh, we actually got built. Uh, this is a one square kilometer site in Nanjing, it's called Hongfeng Tech Park. We started the urban design in 2011. It's a, it's a quite narrow site being separated from the city by two railways, a high-speed train rail on the south and a freight rail on the north and all major through traffics surrounded this site. So we start with a vision of this project. It could be a mysterious landmark seen from the high-speed train, and it should be a very vital and eco-friendly working environment inside. And it's also very efficiently connected programs inside there. So we have this hot dog kind of uh, diagram for the site strategy. Uh, we have a central urban belt in the, in the middle and with this barcode courtyard on the edge. Uh, I forgot to introduce this high-tech uh, park. It's not only about office. It's also uh, with a lot of manufacturing inside, pilot manufacturing, uh, research-related labs, uh, manufacturing and labs research together. So we also structured the central urban belt with its program and the areas for the, uh, for the production and manufacturing. So with this setting, we kind of created a more inclusive uh, inward kind of space with a garden setting in the middle and all these uh, less important programs on the, on the edge towards the high-speed movements. Then uh, it got built um, in 2014 uh, with four architectural firms joining this. We did this one on this uh, west end and we have Atelier Liu Yuyang did this one and Death House, Chen Yifeng from Death House designed the third one and the Scenic Architecture Zhu Xiaofeng did the, uh, the fourth one. So, our urban design then tr translated into this uh, layout of the buildings seen from this Google image then. And we have buildings of uh, four groups of buildings by four offices. And seen from the outside, we share similar uh, facade for our language requirements and uh, building volumes. 
And on, on the, at, the, at the inside of the project, we have a lot of uh, uh, openings, courtyards, in similar scale, but very diff distinctive from one each other as they are designed by different offices. Uh, then I will move on to architectural projects uh, our office did. This one is the, um, the, 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 the building by the, by the West End. Um, since it's very huge volume, we try to eliminate that by different facade wrapping uh, to, to distinguish these, uh, these parts into, into upper and lower parts. And we also make these uh, public facilities visible there instead of morphing them into the major volumes. We have a two-story uh, cafeteria on the, on the front and a three-story public conference room sitting on the rooftop. And that's the entrance to this cafeteria uh, facility. And it's, a, it's very open on the ground floor with three parts and they're, inter they're connected on the second floor. And on the ground floor you can see from two diff different directions towards other buildings. And that uh, conference room on the 4th, 5th and 6th floor is a similar form to these, uh, to these uh, cafeteria facility on the ground. It's a similar facade material and language. And on the railway side, it's more, more enclosed. Um, that's, here's another industrial project we did, but not uh, went so well. It's a, it's a uh, manufacturer uh, from Zhejiang province. They founded their headquarters in Shanghai. We designed their office building and these uh, manufacturing parts. Uh, supposedly, there will be a facade for the lower parts, but ne that's never completed. Because we started the project like this, with this office building to the south. Uh, two years later, they finished these, these three buildings. But then there's this opportunity in Shanghai to, for a high density or urban intensification, they decided to build more buildings and double the FAR for the whole project. So we also did this urban design for them after we have built all, most of the, uh, the, the, the first three buildings. Um, a very high density mixed use with residential towers, small studios, and low-rise as residential as well, and office towers. Um, after these, the developer sold this project to another developer, so we don't know what's going on there, and our building to the south was left like that for almost three years. Um, we also did some small projects. It's, a, it's in Ningbo, called Hangzhou Bay uh, Park, Central Park in Hangzhou Bay area. Um, it's actually park facilities, including uh, WC and other maintenance facilities. It's scattered in the park from east to north in three groups. Uh, and we picked up a common language, we try to use modular um, three meter by three meter or uh, maximum four to five meter rectangular form, irregular forms um, interconnected together for the, for the program like these ones to, uh, for each toilet they will have a shared uh, small entrance space and then the internal space will be 
also divided, contained in these square forms, uh, uh, rectangular maybe. Then, then for the facade, we decided to use a use lower and upper parts two different materials to wrap up on these ones. And since most of the, these structures are, uh, are, are WC, they do not want people outside to see, and they want to also lighting uh, and, and air intaking from, from upper side. So we, we did the composite wood facade on the lower and the glass facade on the upper part, and make a not flat but like a water washed um, kind of marks wrapping around all these uh, irregular forms and it resulted in these kind of uh, structures as they're getting built and it's, um, it, it's a bit strange that initially we designed the upper part as a steel frame structure in, because that's more reasonable for this kind of a small structure but the uh, administration there insisted on concrete structure because that's what they are more familiar with and they can get the budget through using the traditional structure so it cost us a lot of efforts to design this uh, wall section to get a very thin edge exposed and with the curtain wall flooding down and the beams hidden behind them. Uh, then last year, 2012, it's, we got an even smaller project in Toronto not far from here. Uh, it's, a, it's a patio structure for this restaurant called Buku. It's a, it's a Japanese restaurant serving sushi. So the idea came from maybe we should create something like a floating fish. Uh, then we came up with this structural concept. Uh, instead of just put a, 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 like a, you're pulling up blinds, but also you make the these fish shape interconnected between in between, then it will result in a form like this. So this facade then it can be covered with lighting tubes. And um, interestingly there in, in this distillery district in Toronto they require use of heritage wood on any exterior structure as a character for this area. So we use wood for the main structure, but to add a more contemporary um, touch to this, we decided to use lighting tubes covering the structure. Then at night time, it would be lit like this. Um, a initially I thought it would be very easy construction to use uh, PVC pipes which is a material I used a lot of times I will introduce you later in other art projects but later on we found that Canada has very strict regulation on lighting fixtures outdoors they require only certified uh, lighting <coughs> products. So the restaurant spent a lot of money on this lighting, but they are happy about it then. Um, to talk about even smaller projects, we did this uh, in 2011, a project called Cloud Room. Uh, it later on traveled from Beijing to Taiwan, Taizong. Uh, Taiwan Museum, ta uh, Taiwan Art Museum, and it also traveled to Washington DC at the Kennedy Center for Performing Arts. Um, this one is a video. It's 
very simple structure made of uh, steel frames, but uh, I attached these polycarbonate panels using a, <coughs> a steel rod onto the structure. So in a, on a windy day, it will be blown constantly to change according to the outside environment. And if you stay inside of the structure, you will see a lot of uh, shadows uh, generated through the mo moving shadows generated through the movements and reflections as well. the inside of the structure and it's at night time and this one is uh, it traveled to Taiwan and it traveled to Washington DC have this video Okay, maybe this is the last project I can introduce. It's called Green Vandalism. I first made this one for Chengdu Biennial. Uh, since Chengdu is the area in China famous for its bamboo groves, instead of using natural bamboo material, we picked up these PVC pipes and installed them at an outdoor space. And we handing out green marker pens to passbys and ask them to write anything, any drawing, whatever, on these pipes. And to tell them eventually your efforts will get these pipes green. A, a green vandalization. So we received a lot of audiences. They drew a lot of things on these, but actually with uh, some exposure, these green <coughs> traces will be will fade away very soon. So in, in like one week it becomes very washed light yellow color. So another layer of green can be covered on them. So it becomes a project can never achieve but people kind of believe that they can get these things green. And we also made proposal for Vancouver Biennial. A, at the Yale Town uh, David Lamb Park. Um, but this project never 
was carried out because the city, uh, the city's administration, they really were really afraid of this project, saying it's probably promoting vandalization. How about people using these green mark pens on other things? And more recently, last year, we did two variations to the previous project called, uh, called uh, Acoustic Bamboo Grove and Bamboo Grove Lighting. I, I don't have the last one. But it's more about the contemporary situation that no, nobody actually uses a pen to write anything. So in this one, if you pass by, you can you can activate these uh, these pipes, it change color, and you can record your sound. And when the next people coming by, the previous recorded sound will be played. Okay, I think that that's probably too much. <laughs> Yeah, and that's a furniture project. I, I, I will not introduce that one unless any of you come into Shanghai. I'd love to show you at my cafe. <laughs> so maybe go back to some uh, conclusions that actually I think I learned a lot from this practice mixing different things together. That the first thing, architecture is never a profession should be separated from others. You can always learn from other professions, also technically and also from the perspective of other professions. Um, for example, we lots of architects still imagining doing monumental projects, getting things done thoroughly from the mass plan to the interior details, everything being under control. But you have to realize that um, Nowadays, most projects should be like teamwork, people collaborating together, and you have to accept that there will always be, always be differences, variants coming into your project. And how to deal with that, you have to step back and make your architectural proposal really strategic and make it becoming a framework it's like uh, in movie industry, you cannot imagine one people to be the director and all the characters inside there all. So architecture should be probably the same way. And the second thing is that to understand, um, I, I was criticized by a lot of people why I'm doing so many different things. Like it's hard to tell your identity. Are you artist or are you architect? But uh, honestly, nowadays, it's still possible for one person to be in different kind of situations. If not in the, in the in, in, say, profession, but you can still try in different position and, uh, and think about things from different standing points. That will can benefit, you can benefit from that a lot instead of uh, staying too much in, 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 in one, uh, one point of view of everything. That's it. Thank you very much. Hey, um, Bing will answer yeah. Yeah. questions. Um, question. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you all for staying. The great lecture, Bing. Thank you. Um, I find it amazing and mysterious that you work on such a wide range of work. I wonder if there's a particular scale of project that you you find more interesting and more fun than other scale. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I wonder if there's a particular scale, like a small scale project versus like a bigger one that you find more interesting and more fun to work with? Uh, honestly, I would say I enjoy all kinds of scales. I never think scale should be an issue. Like the project I showed there, these 
10 square kilometer new city there, I actually used the same uh, design method as I designed for a much smaller waterfront area. But the same thing is that the strategy could share the same principles. So do the architects in your office also work on the art and design projects, or are, is it, are there separate teams? Some of them do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the lecture, very enjoyable. I was wondering if you could talk a little about your collaborators. So for the urban design scale work, do you have landscape architects on your team or in your office? Or Can you talk a little about how that works? Yeah, it's, it's, that's um, usually happening in different, it happens in different ways. Like uh, in a more recent project, we work on a uh, urban planning competition for a district in Shanghai, it's quite a vast land area. We collaborated with uh, one architect. We, we do the urban design, job, urban design, urban planning job. One architect, one landscape architect, and also one economist who does the programming parts. It's, a, it, it's, it's always necessary. You have to collaborate with others. It's, um, you cannot uh, presume that you have all the knowledge. Even you have strategies. You have to, for a more actual project, you have to work with others. Yeah. And who's the landscape architect in Shanghai? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Who is the, pra what's the landscape architecture practice? It's, ca it's called EU design. It's a, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a small firm. It's, it's a, I think it's, a, it's also interesting that um, in, in nowadays, small offices can collaborate together to deal with last, large projects which uh, usually these kind of big projects are the privilege of these huge corporate firms. But now I think the situation is changing. Uh, with more flexible uh, working collaboration methods, we can do better than them, probably. Thanks so much for the lecture. <coughs> a little over a year ago, the, we'll say the state, um, uh, declared no more weird architecture, yeah. okay? Yeah. And there was an article again in the Times uh, this morning, so I guess I'd just like to have you both comment on the relationship between architectural practice and the state um, on the one hand, but also the regional differences, say, between Beijing and Shanghai in terms of practice. Yeah, um, I don't think there are much differences for practices like mine, small design offices, architects, doing so different in Beijing and Shanghai because uh, I really don't think locality is an issue nowadays. People do travel a lot. Uh, we do projects in Beijing and Shenzhen and they do here, there as well. Um, I think the weird architecture thing is, uh, is that's a really good question. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, 2000, 2014, October 20. I remember I heard about the news. It's, uh, it's very shocking to this design industry. Like, uh, pe probably people like Zaha are very <laughs> scared about that news. <laughs> yeah. um, I think primarily it's associated about budget control because China, the economy in China is a bit slowing down. It's no longer like the peak days, two-digit growth. So especially for government projects, they start to concern about budget control, which is a common thing global-wise. But to put that in the term of uh, weird, weird architecture is really a terrible thing. It's, uh, it's like China has now the issue UK had about Prince Charles yes. criticizing <laughs> contemporary architecture. Uh, thank you very much for the, the lecture covering so many things you have done and uh, I'm particularly interested in like, uh, the few projects you just mentioned in PSA because my pers uh, I personally went there for several times. I like the work they, uh, like especially they have window pianos especially in, uh, in last summer and uh, how 
uh, how your uh, architectural education from on, uh, undergraduate and to graduate level to project yourself as a curator, especially I see like in the second one, the recent, uh, recent one, you like, assign certain place for uh, uh, for artists or architect architects to under a certain topic. How how do you place that kind of position to to other? How's your education or uh, your experience to that? Um, it's kind of my kind of yeah. question. It's kind of Thank you. Uh, I think to be a curator, it's not so much different from being a writer for a journal. You were asked to write an essay on certain topics. It's it's very similar thing. I think if you are educated, you know about your own profession, and you are always concerned about other contemporary issues. It's very, it's very easy to get into that field about uh, curator curation, doing curations. Um, it, I think it's it requires a sensitiveness about. Um, what's happening, what's going on there, and you have connections around, and you know not just your friends in your own profession, but also in other fields. And I think that's very important that keep communication across fields. You, you know artists, you know film directors, uh, you, they, their work or what they do can inspire you as well. Hope that answers your question. No more questions. I have a question, Ben. Um, it's it's related to the Shandigar after Shandigar mm -hmm. um, arrangement and mm -hmm. installation piece. Is the the bigger issue it raises is um, in in let's say a world of globalization especially in a, a city like Shanghai, what is the identity, let's say, of a local architect in Shanghai? Because, um, because you went to school in uh, China, and then you did a master's at Yale, and then um, you, know, you, you, did, you curate this project. It has some Western pieces, it has some local pieces, it has it's, a, it's an. I mean, it's obviously a very, very important question, and I wonder, especially related to the, to the, slowdown in the economy in Shanghai. Look at if, if you if you go. Maybe three years ago, I was a juror on this thing called the Far Eastern Prize, mm -hmm. and I went to Shanghai. We thought we would see all of these incredible new buildings that were that would be judged and be part of the prize. Mm -hmm. All the buildings that were to be decided on were decided on by local, let's say, curators in Shanghai, actually by deans of schools and other people. Every, there, was no, there were no new projects. They were all adaptive use projects. Mm -hmm. So all of the tall buildings were done by multinational corporate offices, but all the really interesting buildings were done by local architects, sort of like what you're curating, right? Yeah. Local architects inflecting kind of global mm, influences, but they were mostly adaptive use projects. Mm -hmm. So part of that now obviously has to do with the downturn in the economy, mm -hmm. but also part of it has to do with trying to define a more authentic identity for Shanghai architecture. Yeah. Could you say something about that? Because it's a big yeah, issue. I, I think you, you raised a very sharp observation on that. Um, for me, I feel that Shanghai is a city never had the issue about identity. It's a city started as a globalization. It's, a, it's a, from its very beginning, it's about the conflicts, differences, uh, meeting together. And, and also, I, I think that on the good side, Shanghai is a, such an enjoyable city. It has nice streets, you no, nobody will be strangers there. Um, but also, I, I think the bad side is that 
it resulted in such a generic global city. As you mentioned, you have all these tall towers designed by these uh, big corporates around the world. Um, and lo the lo localities are kind of separate to these small, small projects. Um, I would say it's, it's a bit changing now. It's, uh, it's, it's be, it, it starts to become a city, start to ask itself what I am, who, who I am. And in this year, uh, the city is commissioning local architects to do a lot of important cultural projects like this house. They're designing the new uh, art museum in Pudong. And also there will be a new library. And I got the news yesterday that uh, these projects, they will have a side competition, which is very interesting, that they will have open competition calling for entries without uh, with very limited conversation, and they tell these participants that you, you can take the competition, you might want, but it will not be built. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So um, I think it is changing, but good or bad, um, I'm not sure. Like the, what Michael Lynn quoted, it, it's terrible. You keep asking yourself who, who you are. It's a, it's, it's, it's not, it's not help solving the issue, but general, only probably generating more con confusion is there. Um, to me, identity is more, but it, it's, it's very personal. So that's why I really like the What's Your Comfort Food project. Mm -hmm. It, it pushes the fusion issue to a personal mm -hmm. level. It's, it's never about, how define it? It's not, or, or say, should not define that. It's just a collective of individualities, and culture becomes the result of. You know. Anything else? Any other questions? <laughs> Bumping. Uh, oh, wait, well, Victor has one. Uh, so uh, I got two questions actually. Thank uh, you, Victor. <laughs> one question is, uh, so you have like all these different uh, interests, so did you develop that early on in your career, like at school maybe, or was that like much later on when you started collaborating with other people? And the second question is, so what's next for you? So after doing all these stuff, do you have something else that you want to dive into? Three Correct. cities. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess, yeah. Yeah. Uh, What's the first question? The first question is, <laughs> when, when did you start um, having the interest of like these different fields? Like, did it start like at school or early on in your career, or later on when you start collaborating with people? Uh, I think started early as um, as far as I'm curious about anything, these things, curious about what these people are doing. Then we talk, we collaborate. It's, it's, it just happens. And for your second question. Um, Maybe directing a movie. Cool. That's what I was cool. going to say. I would have guessed it. Yeah. But, then, you know, but Victor's question is an interesting one because the way you show the projects mm -hmm. and the way you talk about them, we imagine that you're doing one and then the other one and then the other one and the other one. That's not true. You're doing them all at the same time. Yeah. So it's not like you're five to six you're a you're a sculptor and you're seven to eight you're a curator yeah. and you're an urban designer you're actually doing all these all the all at once right yeah that's that's different yeah, yeah. And that way, i think yeah. that's easier yeah. you can think about being an artist like a break a vacation from the architectural works <laughs> so film so are you, are you gonna do, are you gonna direct a movie now let's direct the three cities movie Three cities. <laughs> I can't think of a better way to end. The <laughs> Big thank you to the three of Thank you all for coming. It's a new time. I know it's complicated.